good, a good tool here, other than the fact that it lacks help. Um, we've gotten it working in the pipeline. We've got it working standalone. We've been very consistent with it. Uh, we've not done a lot of inline comments. Now, how many of you are a fan of inline comments? Meh, okay. I think, you're, you're, I think your love of them is misplaced, but whatever. Um, and, and I'll back that up in a second. Comments lie. What's that? Comments lie. Comments lie. They do lie. Except for the comment that says, I don't know what this code does, don't touch it. That one's true. <laughs> Modify nothing below this. I, 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 have, I have written that comment. Um, you know, from here to next marker, Y2K, don't touch. Um, we'll, we'll get into that in a second. One of the reasons I'll, in class a lot of times I, I, I will kind of habitually not do inline comments is just to save space on the screen. But I, I do feel there's value. What, what is the alleged value of inline comments? Let's explore this for just a moment. Why bother? To tell why. To explain your code, right? I get that. That makes sense if you're not lying. But Look at a line like, like line 14 here. Is there a big mystery about what's happening there? Is it confusing in any way? In, in other words, if I were to do this, does that make it clearer for you? Oh, look, new sim session creates a new sim session. Damn. So. There is a little bit of, of need to recognize that PowerShell is not a traditional programming language and that many times you are not writing complex algorithmic code. You are running a command that has a fairly plain English name and is relatively self-descriptive. If you need to describe your code, do so, but don't clutter your code just because someone in school told you that you should comment your code. If it's already self-explanatory, leave it be. Sometimes, sometimes a little white space can go a long way. If you're just trying to make your code a little clearer, a little easier to follow, a little white space that kind of breaks off the different sections, here's where I'm getting a bunch of data. Here's where I'm assembling that into an object. That can take the place of the need to comment. Comments shouldn't impose an additional burden. Like if I have to wade through a bunch of comments, here's what I really hate. And how many of you have ever done the scripting games before? Here's the comments you would see. Like the person writing the code is afraid of the criticism and so they're like pre-explaining themselves, right? That is exactly the same as getting pulled over by a cop and the cop walking up and going, look, the reason it smells like dope in here is not because I've been smoking dope. It's this new perfume I had and it was meant to be a joke. Get out of the car, right? Don't, don't pre-justify yourself before you've even been accused. So don't do that. That's just putting a reading burden on someone. That's not fair because most people can't read very well. Right? We know that. So if you do run into a place in your code where you're doing something algorithmically complex and you feel the need to put in a block comment that explains the logic, yes, do that. How many of you find yourself doing, creating little section headers, right? Uh, Who does that? Who's seen it? Oh, I know you've seen it. Yeah. No. Don't do that. However, however, that's okay. That's fine. 
let that create a little section header for you. And in fact, I will even go so far as to say, if you have a lot of verbose code going on and you wanna do something like this in the verbose output, so that you can have a little hard visual marker in the output of where each computer starts, yeah. That incidentally can help make my code a little bit more documented and a little bit clearer to read, but it's also useful to the poor schmuck who's running your code. You get dual purpose from it. You'll do stuff like that in the control script. And that's okay there too, if you feel it's not, especially when it's verbose and it can be used by both parties, right? That, that makes sense to me, I understand that. That has a, a useful purpose to it. Um, what you don't wanna do is make it so complicated that the output just goes on forever and it doesn't serve any real purpose, right? Verbose is, it's okay if, if there's a lot, that's what verbose means, right? It's a lot, talk a lot, la 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 la. But make sure there's a purpose behind all of it, that it's conveying information and that it's aiding you in a debugging process or in, a, in understanding the flow of the script perspective. Make sure there's a use for it. Don't, you know, don't, do, do. I, I do see this. You'll laugh. Don't do that, that's not helpful. If you need to have some documentation of who owns the script and who to contact in the event of a problem, that goes in your comment-based help so that someone can get that information without having to open the code in an editor. They can just run help. If it's meant to communicate some useful background information about your script, put it in comment-based help. That's where it belongs. If it's a comment explaining, this script uses SIM, so you need to make sure that SIM has been enabled on the component devices, that goes in your comment-based help because the person running it needs to know that information. If you're trying to communicate something to the, the runner of the script, it needs to be in the help. That's the only legit place for it. They should not have to open the code because code is scary. And if they open the code, what are they going to do to it? They're going to touch it. And that's going to break it because change is bad, right? That's why we have ITIL, to stop change. <laughs> One of the places that I use the inline commenting, a lot of my code, my tools, get down level to new learners as I'm trying to get people to start adapting PowerShell. So even with like new sim session, I'll put that in there with you know, creating a sim session in order to reuse on, or on uh, get sim instance calls. And that way, new users, as they're reviewing the code and trying to learn. So you put it in there as a teaching tool. Yeah, um, I don't hate that. Given my background, I would be more likely to take my code without those comments and make an internal blog article out of it where I can say, here's the code and a text file for you, but let's go through it line by line. These three lines do that da, 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 and get very expository about it there and make an article out of it, like I do when I write books, which is why I would probably do that because it's, it's familiar to me. Um, I don't know that I would do, do the inline comment purely as an educational thing because it does make maintaining that thing harder. But if this is a separate artifact that's being used for training, yeah, that, that's fine. Sure, that's not a bad, bad idea. I would still probably make a blog article out of it. A little bit more permanent. What do you think about people like me who freak out when there's too much on the screen? It's like collapse a bunch of use cases and regions. It's like a uh, way. Yeah, so, so folks who use the, the collapsing, the code outlining feature, and who define, you know, you can define a region and comment that, and that's not a PowerShell thing, that's an ISE thing, right? That's the editor recognizes those regions. That's fine. Um, I will frequently uh, save my, my modules, which we'll get to in a minute, uh, completely collapsed. So every function is totally collapsed so that I can just go straight to the one I want very quickly and expand it out. I think that's great. Using code outlining is, is a wonderful way to keep yourself kind of visually focused. Let me offer you one other bit of advice. If you've got some really complicated algorithmic thing Maybe it's a, a big chunk of logic that decides what user group someone should go into or whether they should be in a particular user group or something else. 
Get that out of there. That should be a separate function. That's a separate tool. If it's complicated enough that it needs a paragraph of explanation to describe how the logic works, separate it. It will become easier to test. Even if its whole purpose is to do nothing but return true or false for some given input, that's completely a legitimate case. Use the right verb, right? Test usually is the verb when we're expecting a true false. So test validity for group membership, whatever you want to call it. If it's complicated enough that it needs a big explanation, pull it out so that it can be tested separately, maintained separately, and then where it is used doesn't have to be cluttered. You're just calling the tool and the name of the tool tells you what it does. And if you want to know more about its logic, you go look at that code. So the more you can break things down, the easier it gets to maintain. Going back to begin process, would you use that in, an, or in any other case that you don't use value from pipeline? Uh, if you do not have value from pipeline and or value from pipeline by property name, if those don't exist, then you don't need begin process or end because they'll never be seen. They'll never be used. Um, that's not that's not 100 million percent true, what I just said, but it's mostly true. Like you can still pipe stuff to a script that does not define those because these didn't exist in the first version of PowerShell. This is what's called sort of a script commandlet uh, or an advanced function it's about to become. So PowerShell still has the ability to do stuff. There's a variable that would pick up the pipeline input, dollar sign underbar. So you could still actually write a function that accepted pipeline input, needed begin process and end, but did not have that parameter declaration that way. Um, you, would, you would be a, a, doing a disservice to humanity. There's a reason this is declaratively set up this way. It's because it's clearer. Uh, so try and avoid those old things. How many of you have ever written a filter no need. Um, if you're curious, the difference between a, a filter is basically a function that only has a process block. You don't define the process block. It's just understood to only be a process block. Fun story. True story. Ask some of the team if you don't believe me because you'll get to see them Tuesday night. Filter was the first thing they wrote when they started writing out the language. And they kind of had this idea that functions would be this one thing and filters would be this other thing. And, and the intent was you would pipe something into a filter, but only certain things would come out of it. Kind of like your own custom where object. And then they wrote where object. And then they decided that functions really could do all the same thing. They literally forgot to take the filter keyword out before they shipped it. It is an artifact. It is an accident. It's like that third child that you had when you were 40. Like, <laughs> wow, who knew? Right? No, the, the filter keyword. Uh, it, it would look something like, like that. Yeah, don't. All right, let's make this a function. Yay, it's a function. So, it, whoops. Oh, I want both. Is there a point of the write object or write object and not just putting object on that line? Is there a point to write output? Uh, yeah, sorry, yeah, right. Yes. Um, just putting object there is implicitly calling write output anyway. Oh. And I hate implicit anything. Because it requires me to know something that the next guy might not know. If I put write output and he doesn't know what that is, he can look it up. If I just put obj, you can't look that up. You have to know that it's implicitly calling write output. I mean, in fact, you know, when you run a pipeline, that's always happening, right? So you have to know stuff. Uh, and I find that where people inevitably run into problems with PowerShell is the implicit stuff. Because it's, it's invisible. It's just magic. Uh, so what's the name of this thing? Get OS info. I cannot just run get OS info here. Doesn't exist. I could, I could hit tab here and it would go find the script. Not the same thing. I cannot run my get OS info function. Because it hasn't run. 
right? It, it's not defined in the shell. In fact, we can look at the function drive and prove that get OS info is not over here in the shell. Correct? All right. So that's in my second version. So let's just run get OS info too. Okay, now I ran the script, right? So now I should be able to run get OS info, right? No. Host.privatedata.error. I don't know what command that is, boss. That's because the script ran. It defined the function in that script's scope. And then the script finished, and that scope went away, and the function went with it. What happens in script stays in script. Right? Just like Vegas. But if I come over here to the ISE, Same, same error. Still doesn't work. You'll have to take my word for it. It's the same error. Let me run this. Okay, I ran it. Now it worked. The script ran, the script finished, and the function lived. The ISE is different from the console. The ISE explicitly puts your command prompt in the same scope as that script. So you can test this thing more easily and quicker late. But that means it behaves differently than the console, which is why I only ever run a quick sort of, let me just see if that's gonna immediately blow up. No, fine. This is where I always test everything because this is the actual execution environment. If you're scheduling a task, it's running here, not the ISE. If you're pushing it to a remote machine, it's running here, not the ISE. Those hosts all implement this model, not the ISE's model. So don't get lazy about just testing in the ISE. What happens if I make a change in here? Right verbose. I'll save it. Let's run this. Wait, wait, where's my, where's my new verbose output? Oh, I didn't run this again. I have seen people in classes and in production bang their heads against a desk for an hour. And it's after I explain what's happening, and so I let it happen to them. I let it, I watch, and I giggle. And they eventually figure out that it's because they didn't rerun it to redefine that function. Whereas over here, You'd figure that out a lot quicker. Anyone ever done that? No, I pull well that what's wrong. I just forgot. Yeah. It's easy. Right? You just kind of get going and you're in and you're back and in and in, then it doesn't work. So we're gonna save this as a script module now. Which is really just putting it in the right location and saving it as a different file name. So we're gonna save as. Uh, everyone read that? No, of course not. Let's go to program files, Windows PowerShell, modules. We're going to make a new folder for this. Where's the new folder button? New folder, Don class. And in there, we will name this thing Don class.psm1. Okay? That's all you have to do to make a script module. It has to have a psm1 file name. That's it. That's the only hard requirement, is that it have a PSM1 file name. If you did it right, look at the play icon in the ISE. It's now grayed out, because you can't run a module. You can import it, and then you can run the commands in it, but you can't run it. If you want the shell's magic auto-discovery of modules and auto-loading of them to work, then your PSM1 file has to be in one of the predefined locations in the PS module path environment variable. I have chosen the program files one. Um, you'll notice that I have the SQL Server tools installed, so I have an extra path that points to that folder. That's the best practice. 
right? If, if you're installing software that drops a bunch of modules onto the system, you should modify PS module path so that PowerShell can find your modules. Don't just necessarily dump them all in program files. Your script modules that you're writing, sure. So the approved way to do that is just to modify that environment variable? The approved way to do that is to modify the environment variable. So typically in like a Windows installer package, you've got the ability to tack on to environment variables, and that's what you would do. If you don't put it there, if you don't put your module in one of the magic locations, how can you load it? Full path. Full path. Which is fine, that might be perfectly okay for some use that you've got. Now that that's there, I should be able to run get OS info, just the command, and have it work. Now it's in memory. Now if I go make any changes, blah, 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 I hit save, come back over here, what do I have to do? I have to remove module get OS info, or what did I call it, dawn class, there we go. I'll often do this on one line so that I can just easily come get that on my command history real quick. Or, you know, you can hit the F7 bit, right? You can find it there too. Uh, I don't like to do import force. Remember, I like to do everything explicitly, all spelled out. I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm saying I don't like to do it. No, nah. it could just as easily be a semicolon. I think I normally probably type a semicolon. I've got a bandaid on or a bandaid on, and it's throwing my typing off. What was the? F7? What was the oh, you didn't know about F seven? That's not a PowerShell thing. That she's like, oh my god, been there since version one. Thanks for playing. <laughs> um, that is not a PowerShell thing. That is this console app thing. Uh, that works with. DOS too, or command.exe. I know, who knew? Comment tab search. Kabhuba? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, comment uh, and then tab. It'll go through your history. But you can actually type like you pound. Yeah, yeah, like remove and it'll find it. Yeah. Yeah. There's a bunch of little cool things that are rigged up in there. Cool so far? Why bother saving things as a module? Yeah, it's easier. For one, if I'm keeping everything in separate scripts, I can really only have one command per script. A script is a command. Right? There's a lot of different types of commands in the world. There's commandlets, which are usually written in C-sharp and compiled into a DLL. There's script commandlets, which is this function we've written. There's a script, which is also a command. So if, you've, if you're keeping your commands at a script level, it's one file per command. It just gets to be a hassle to manage it all. Deploying that, keeping track of the files, ah, it's not, not fun. With a module, you can put several different related things in here. And so one of the things you have to talk about is what are the boundaries of a module? Should I put everything into one module? There's two answers. And these are, are things that you have to consider along with each other. One is technological and the other is political. The technology one is try to only bundle things together that are technologically related. Either they call each other or they depend on each other or they both work with the same set of stuff. Like if you write a bunch of functions that are gonna help you manage some uh, in-house uh, in application you have, put those in one module, they go together. So there's that. The political aspect of it is how many people are working on this thing? And what sort of collaboration tools do you have? Can you afford to put 100 functions that five people are working on into one thing? Or does it make sense to break those out so that you don't have as many collaboration points that you have to worry about? Purely political and workflow. The tools you have, the processes you use, the people, personalities that you have to deal with, that's gonna drive that decision. I've seen a lot of situations where 12 commands that I would say definitely went together were in three different modules just because the three people working on them didn't get along very well. That's fine. That, you know, it happens. People suck. It is what it is. Is there a also time stop people from having a dot source file if you don't do it as a module? Um, if you don't do it as a module, people have to dot source things, which gets messy. 
they're harder to manage the scope that way. I don't like dot sourcing, not a fan. Yeah, there's times, a couple times when you have to use it, but come to my D stupid DSC tricks class. We'll go, we'll do all the stupid stuff then. Well, yes and no. What we're talking right now is a script module. So what you're talking about is the next thing we're going to do. Yeah. We'll do that now. It's a good segue. It's like we have that ESPN thing you just knew. So if we go over to where that thing lives. Oh, that's a lot more stuff than I thought was there. There it is. There's a couple of concepts in PowerShell that it's important to draw a line between because ter the terminology more or less conflates these all as one thing and it shouldn't. This folder is actually a module. That is the loadable unit. That is the thing you import and the thing you remove. That file <coughs> is a script module which is a component of that module which implies that this module can contain more than one thing. The only just and true way for you to have a multi-module, sorry, a multi-component module is if you include a manifest. So let's, let's do that. Uh, new module manifest, name, name, no path, path, on class.psd1 PowerShell Delta 1 root module is my PSM1 scroll oh we ran out of scroll I should fix that PowerShell has a load order preference when you tell it to import module Dawn class it's going to go to that folder and the first thing it's going to look for is a PSD1 manifest. And if it finds it, it's going to load it. So we're going to dig into that manifest and why you should be using it and what else it does. If it doesn't find a PSD1, what's the next thing it looks for? It looks for donclass.dll. So it looks for a, a .NET compiled, a binary module, and it will load that. And if it doesn't find that, it will look for donclass.psm1 in its head, it kind of makes up a manifest that only includes that file, and then it loads it. So let's look at that manifest. Everybody read that? <laughs> How about now? So the root module is, is the first thing that gets loaded. That has everything you need. Uh, you can give it a module version. Uh, it needs to have a GUID to uniquely identify it in memory with PowerShell. When I ran new module manifest, it created a new GUID for me. That's why the, the easiest way to make these is to use that command. From there, hand edit is really easy. This is where you can put your author and your company name and all that. And that becomes a property of the module. You can have it specify a minimum version for PowerShell or that it only wants to be run by a certain PowerShell host like the console or the ISE or some other host, if that's what you've got. So you can put a lot of restrictions here. My preference is to put those here rather than in a requires comment in the code. Because if you're going to use a manifest, it should contain all the metadata for the entire module, one location for that stuff. <clears throat> and it can contain a lot more. Uh, host version, .NET framework version, that's a very cool thing to think about filling out. Because especially if you're using external modules that have their own dependencies. You can document everything right at this level. Minimum version of the common language runtime, if it's 64-bit or uh, 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 what was the other one? 64 came before 64, 62-bit, whatever. Here's where you can document other modules that this thing needs to load. So you would uncomment that line and then put a comma delimited list of module names. When the module is loaded, it will load your root first and then it will load these. 
Uh, required assemblies, so these would be DLLs. Any scripts that you want it to run? Anyone ever see this in production? Anyone ever use Exchange? Exchange uses this. They run a couple of scripts in addition to their, all their functions. These two things are fun. PowerShell has an ETS, an extensible type system. And you can force it to, when it loads your module, load up a type extension. Not a lot of people have a lot of need for that. We're going to get into it a little bit. But the next one we're actually going to do is this. You can tell it, hey, my code outputs objects. And I have created customized default views for what I want those to look like when the output displays. So I want you to load those up when you load my module. Uh, nested modules, those can also uh, import modules for you. And then functions to export, as well as variables and aliases to export. You'll notice that the default is all. What this means is every function, commandlet, variable, or alias defined in your module will be visible to the user you can create private functions. You know, function A is the one I want everybody to use, but function B and C get, get used by A. I just don't want anyone calling them directly. I'm not proud of them. I kind of want to keep them a little hidden. So you can say, go ahead and export A, and as soon as you start naming the ones you do want to export, everything else becomes hidden by default. Only things that live in the same module can access them. So they become private. Yeah, you can, do it, you can do it in the PSM one, too. Uh, and the way you do it is at the bottom. Export module member function get OS info. As soon as you call export module member, everything not listed with it becomes private. So the default is everything unless you choose to create a list, in which case the default is private if it's not in your list. It's a little backwards from every other programming language ever, but this is what happens when you try to make something easy to use by default. You get weirdness. What do you prefer? I mean, what's stylistically, what's... What do I prefer? You mean for exporting? Yeah, yeah I mean, whether you do it here, because this can do functions, variables... Functions, variables, aliases, everything, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or do it inside the manifest? Uh, I do it in the manifest. If I have a manifest, and I usually do, I do it in the manifest. Do you, always, do you ever leave the star or do you always put it in the names? Uh, do I ever leave the star or do I always put in the names? Uh, in a production environment, I always put in the names. I get explicit with it. That has, has kicked me in the butt once or twice, right? Because I added a new function and I forgot. I'm like, what the heck? But, you know. I, I thought if you leave the star, it has to parse the entire thing in the book. Um, well, yeah, we can talk about the performance in just a sec. There is a performance thing. You can declare those helper functions in your begin statement as well. Is that correct? You can declare your function, your helper functions anywhere inside of your function. They can go in a begin block if it's going to accept pipeline input. Yeah, I don't like to do that. Um, it, it creates unnecessary scoping that I find makes debugging a lot harder. In other words, let's say I've got some complex algorithmic doohickey and it's embedded in another function. I can't test it by itself. Whereas if I pull it up a layer, export it, I can test it all I want to and then take it off the export list and it vanishes. So I like everything at one level. I never use nested functions, no. No, but I also learned to program in VBScript, so we barely even had, we had a go-to statement. <laughs> no, no, I put a bunch of functions in, in a single PSM1, but I never put a function in another function. So doesn't that limit the reusability of those functions, though? If you, want, if you had them in separate PSM files, and you just, can't you just call them and make them part of the module? Um, I could put them in separate files and munge them all together, but it slows down PowerShell's parsing of those quite a bit. So and here's an example, and this is kind of where he was going to. If I do this, you got to remember that there's a couple of things PowerShell uses this, this manifest for. When you load up the shell, it goes out to all the magic directories in the PS module path, 
and it has to enumerate every single module to find out what commands it has because it will let you tab complete those even though they haven't been loaded into memory yet. So it has to go discover them. Now if you've got a function, or sorry, if you've got a PSM1 with a hundred functions in it, forcing PowerShell to enumerate all those at load time can create a significant hit. Start doing that a lot and you're, you're like, you only want to open the shell in the morning. You're going to open it, you're going to go get coffee, and you're going to leave that sucker open all day long because it's going to take a hit. Explicitly listing them with an export module member is much faster because that's the first thing it scans for. More importantly, create a manifest and put all of your exported members in the manifest and it takes it no time at all because it knows right where to go. Here's the list. It doesn't have to parse any code. That's hugely important. Without a manifest, PowerShell has to go get your script. It has to run it through its parser. It actually has to turn it into code so that it can tell where all the functions are. If you've got a long, long script with a bunch of stuff in it, it's got to read it all. And how does that work in a hybrid? Kind of like what she was saying. I mean, I, I do that myself. I put all of my functions in separate PS1 files in a folder, but I still explicitly declare each if you're, function. So whether you put all your functions in a file or your functions in one file a piece is a workflow thing. It doesn't affect the performance of what you're If you have a manifest, it will never load any of those as part of auto discovery. So you have a manifest. Whether you choose to do one pump function for the profile or you put 20 in a file, that's just your personal workflow. If you have a manifest. If you don't have a manifest, that model doesn't work. Seems like you should always have a manifest. I mean, you you should. You should um, the only reason not to have one is you didn't know they existed, now you all do. So. <laughs> If you use a manifest and you publish to a repo like the PowerShell gallery, then yes, uh, on your, the auto-generated web page it creates and on the information about your module, it will know what your commands are because th that's going up to a cloud and they're not parsing your code. So without a manifest, they have no idea what's in there. Yeah, there, there is no good reason to not have a manifest. Short answer. Everyone make a manifest. Okay. How many of you have ever made a custom format view? Did you have a good time? No. <laughs> Even following your steps, it wasn't easy. <laughs> have you ever found documentation for it? Copy and paste what works. Copy and paste what works. That's not the same as documentation. No. So you won't. You won't find documentation for that XML format. And the reason you won't is because they don't want to lock themselves down. And if they document it, they can't change it without telling you. And if they don't document it, they can change it without telling you. That's why. So um, here's how we do it for reals. I'm going to create a new file here. Uh, I don't, this doesn't need to have a special name, but it does need to have a .format.ps1xml extension. Now, these things are considered code. Because they can, in fact, contain code. Uh, we can put some in here. So because they contain code, they are subject to your execution policy, which means if you have an execution policy that requires a digital signature, these have to be signed. And you can use the set authentic code signature command to sign one of these if you want to. So just be aware of that. All the Microsoft ones are signed using a Microsoft digital certificate. Uh, th that actually becomes fairly important. So, oops. Let's just open one. That big enough? So if we go all the way to the bottom of this, There's the signature. I cannot stress enough the importance 
of not changing this file and then saving it. Do not do that. Because if you change the file and save it, what have you done to the signature? And will PowerShell continue to load it? No matter what your execution policy is, it will not load the file. And PowerShell will suddenly work a lot different. It will not look the same. It will not technically be broken. You can go to another machine running the same version of PowerShell and copy theirs over to fix yours. So I mean, this isn't unrecoverable, but just don't. So we're gonna we're gonna grab some stuff here. Um, this is the absolute ghetto way that we do this. Copy and paste. Copy and paste. Um, in PowerShell version 2, 1 and 2, these XML files are case sensitive. If you get it wrong, it will explode into a million shiny pieces. Version 3 and higher eliminated the, the case sensitivity. I think, before, I think what they actually did is they, they read the content and force it all to lowercase and then parse it as an XML document. Um, because no one could ever get it right. Um, I used to teach this in my classes when we did like hands-on labs and we would have to spend like half a day just one, no, uppercase, no, slash, n it is what it is. If you've got a decent XML editor that you like, I would use that to do these because it will at least help you make sure your tags are closed and, and everything else. Um, my favorite one is uh, the Win32 process one right here because it's a table control and that's what I want to make. So I have to grab this whole table control section. And you about that there, copy. Paste. So let's look at the top of this. I need to give this a name. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, you will often see a .NET type name there. That is purely for the convenience of the human being who wrote this file. It doesn't matter. Uh, do you know why the name is there? Anyone ever run into why the name is there? I will show you. And you will not believe that this has been in there for all time and you didn't know. Here's one of the format commands. If you use the minus view parameter, you can give it the name of the view you want it to use. You can actually have multiple different views for a given type of object. PowerShell will use the first one as a default, but you can force it to use a different view. How many of you knew it could do this? Do you want to know how you get a list of the available views? Yes. They never wrote that. That's why you didn't know it was there. <laughs> this has been in there since day one, 2006. Uh, in fact, if you look at this one we were messing with, the this, this system type name here is a system.diagnostics.process. The next view, now well, somewhere in here, yep, system.diagnostics.process. The name here is process with username. Check this out. Get process looks like this, right? Get process format table view. What the hell is it? Yeah, but there's a username parameter on the uh, on the first command line of that one. There's like an include username on that command line. Doesn't do this. Oh, really? Why are you being like that? Process with username. Oh, yeah. All right. So, no, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. This, this is a bad example because in the more recent version of PowerShell, because they have never documented how to get to views, when you run get process with that include username, it produces a different object type. They've, they've whacked with it in the type extension system to give it this thing at the end so that it auto selects that, um, which means I'd have to produce it with that to run that view. Anyway, fun stuff. So moral of the story, the view doesn't matter. The name doesn't matter. Next bit of data, type name. This is important. 
This is the .NET Framework fully qualified class name for the object that this view applies to. When PowerShell needs to display an object, it goes and looks in here at all the format files it's loaded, loads about half a dozen by default, and it looks to find a view that corresponds to whatever object type it needs to display. So what object type is it we're trying to display? Let's go back over to our script. What object type are we trying to display? That's not good because freaking everything is a PS object. That is a distinct problem. And that's why I put it into a variable before I output it at it. So this type name is now the one we're going to stick in there. Make sense? That's awesome. Nope. We've been able to do this since version one, long before God gave us classes. Do you know why we have classes in version five? It's not really. I mean, that's what they apply to. But what what problem were they they were trying to solve? Essentially, people complaining that there were no classes. There was no actual technology problem. They will. They, it makes it more appealing to C sharp developers who should just code in C sharp. That's why we gave them Visual Studio and C sharp. Yeah, they will tell you that there are reasons, and they're lying. It is not true. <laughs> Tell Bruce Payette I said that. Don't. All right, I'm going to clean, clean some of this up here uh, just so we can look at more of it. Uh, let's leave him. Ah, these are hard to read. OK, so you got two, two basic sections next. The table headers, right? Those are the, the headers with the lines underneath them, right? This is how you can make PowerShell lie to people. Because they look at your output and they assume that the table header is the property name. But it's not. It's whatever you put in here. And so you could put Fred as the column header. And when they try and run your command and type it to select object and only display the Fred column, but there is no Fred column. But there was right there. It's all a lie. A lot of commands do that. How many table column headers are there in this snippet? Oh, here's one. That's two. That will screw you every single time you copy and paste. What that means is use the property name as the column header with no extra width or alignment instructions. It will auto figure out the width and it will auto figure out the alignment. That messes people up every single time. So we're gonna delete it. I hate those. After your headers are your actual entries. So this is the data that's going into the columns. Now with most of these, you're simply gonna say in this column display this property. Done. No problem. Sometimes, however, you may want to have an item, oh, come back here, that executes code. Dollar sign underbar will give you access to the object for the current table row. And then as you can see here, we're checking to see if the CPU property is not equal to an empty array. And if it is not equal to an empty array, then we're running its to string to turn it into a string. So we're going to get rid of that too. So we've only got one and one. And I'm going to wipe out the width and alignment. So let's say we want to do machine. See, because we want to lie to people, right? Security through obscurity. It'll, they'll auto size and auto align, yeah. So string values will left align, uh, integers will right align. 
Uh, what else we got? Model, make, no, model, model, and make. Uh, if you do not have the same number of rows as headers, it will explode. So check yourself on that real careful. Uh, and this is going to be computer name. This is SP version. This one is model. And this one is MFG, MFGR. Save. Okay. Let's go back to our manifest. Formats to process. What did I call that? My views. My views dot 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 format dot ps1 xml eh eh console remove module don class good get o s info computer name dc win a1 yay me um, it is, because I didn't specify any widths, it's trying to fill the width of my console windows definition automatically, which is one reason you will often want to specify widths. If I'd specified widths, it wouldn't have all that nasty space in between. But the underlying object is the same. I've just changed what its default view is. So if you were really picky about your columns being in a particular order and so forth, rather than using an ordered hash table to create your property list, take a minute and create a view. It's the right thing to do. Why are you lazy? You, you get, you basically get paid by the hour, so I mean. Yeah, it, you can do so much more to make the end user happy this way without compromising the integrity and the consistency of your code because you've separated the code from the presentation. And every single software designer ever will tell you separating code and presentation is highly desirable. Is there a way to force an auto size? Uh, you cannot force, you can't force auto size. You would have to actually go in and define widths for these columns. So we can do that real quick because it seems like you're going to make me. Well, you could pipe it to, to FT, but that kind of defeats the purpose of this being a default. Uh, not that works. It's not been implemented. So this only needs to be two. This, let's make it 10. Let's make that 10. Save. Remove module, don class. Get OS info, computer name, DC, one a one Ping. And see, now I've made it ugly. It's very desirably ugly. Um, I can I can format list it. That's no problem. Because it's not going to use that. Its default on list is to display all properties, and because I have not defined a compatible alternate version, right? Like my my XML file doesn't have a list view. It only has a table view. If I put a list view in there, I could have a separate view for that. So if you just piped it to FL, it would use that list view. Uh, and if the list view was first in the file, then it would use that as its default. So you can define the column order from this, right? Yeah, it, it is, it, whatever you put in the XML, it will obey in terms of order. Uh, you cannot do, you can't sort things, no. Right, well, by the time it gets to using that XML file, all the processing is over with. It's just looking for how to lay it out on the screen. So there's, there's no, well, you can put code in on a line by line basis. It doesn't have access to the whole array at that point. So it's not a replacement for sort object. 
Can you show us the type? I'm just trying to see what that does yeah. after putting that insert thing in the PS type. That's cool. <coughs> just for clarification, so let's say you uh, put your go get OS info computer name your command into parentheses and your uh, on a dot source C attribute or in dot reference C attribute for SP version. You've created the output table to use SP. Okay, okay, I, I, I get where you're going. Okay. My table says SP. If I run this and pipe it to select, I want the computer name and SP version. The output view does not change the code. That is strictly a human eyeball consumption thing. If I were to say machine and SP, I get nothing, which is a little vexing and throws people off all the time. Because I haven't changed any of the underlying code, I've just applied a wrapper to it. That, that creation of machine and SP doesn't occur until that spot in the pipeline. After all the code has run, whatever's in the pipeline goes to out default. That gets piped to out host. Out host calls on the formatting subsystem, which goes and grabs my XML and does its magic and creates the screen display. Could I alias it to make it work somehow? Could you alias it to make it work? Alias what to make who work? A alias SP to SP version? No. You can't alias it because that SP doesn't exist until all your code has run. It's not, this is important. This table is not showing you property names. It never has. It's showing you column headers, which are arbitrary and are created after all the code is over with. Uh, I can show you some perfect examples where this kind of nonsense goes on and you've seen it all the time and you haven't even paid attention to it. There is no property called WS parenthesis K parenthesis. Never has been. There's a WS, which is an alias property to the working set, right? If we take a look at this in GM, there's WS. It is an alias of working set, which is the real property name. None of which has anything to do with the column header displayed by the default lying output. Can I show you where I define the type name? Maybe. You were sleeping? No, I was typing in my computer. Well, you're not supposed to be keeping up with typing. I'm going to give you all my code. I'm going to post it for free on the intertubes. It'll be on donjones.com. Probably maybe like tomorrow morning. Even. What happens if you put like system dot string in there? Uh, what happens if I put system dot string in there? Any already existent object Totally legit. And if there's some type extension that applies to strings, it will try and run against my object. And if that type extension involves accessing some methods or properties that my object doesn't have, it will explode into a million tiny pieces. Um, there is no, there's no overlap thing. Um, you can do some neat things with this in terms of pseudo inheritance and blocking access to underlying objects in favor of a proxy and you can do some wackiness so it's not recommended but you can kind of you can get crazy yes do most type names by default have a default view um yeah no well so there, there's two things that happen um, you know, let's just go all the way into the weeds. Let's get crazy. Nope. That one. Get member is the way to look at property names. 
Because for, format list can lie to you as well. Okay, that, that was well, but however, so here's the process. And this, this all happens magically. The minute you hit a format command, and that includes end of pipeline, <coughs> implicit out default, implicit out host, that's when the formatting subsystem gets called. So you run a format command, or you hit the end of the pipeline, and it implicitly calls a format, the, the system, okay? The first thing PowerShell does, if it doesn't know what else to do, is it looks to see if there is a type extension that defines a default set of properties to display. So default, default, gosh, that's tiny, display, there. Nope, that is an eater, darn it. Property set, there. So this is a type extension. This actually modifies the object itself. Type extensions can include a lot of things, and I'm going to show you a few, but one of them is the addition of a default display property set. So if I ask PowerShell to format this object to display it, and there is not a view available, then it will use these properties. And the number of these properties will tell me if it's going to be a table or a list. If there's one, two, three, or four of these, I get a table. If there's five or more, I get a list. This assumes that an XML view did not exist for this object type. So some of the other types of um, extensions that you might run into are things like alias properties. This got added by that XML type extension. Those are real members of the object. You can manipulate those. I could select VM. I could filter on WS. They're real. These get added to the object as it hits the pipeline, not later. So uh, PowerShell needs to display something. Step one, is there a view defined for that object type? If so, end of question, use that view, go about your business. No, there isn't a view defined. Is there a default display property set? Yes, there is. Okay, display a table or a list based on how many properties are in that set. Great. No, there's not a default display property set. Fine, display all of the object's properties, which will almost invariably be a list. Okay, that makes that's perfect explanation. It's in my book. It's chapter nine, I think. <laughs> Everyone buy my book? PowerShell Month of Lunches, great book. Tool making is even better. Buy them both, really. Why, why make the decision or take the chance? Um, I actually don't know. Is, is that the tool making one or the new one? We're, uh, no, it's not in the tool making one. No, it's in PowerShell in depth too. You should buy all three, really. Um, and actually, you know what? For, for PowerShell in depth, all three authors are going to be here. So Amazon, that sucker, have it show up tomorrow at your hotel and we'll sign it. That's rare. Because um, Richard lives in a different country and we don't let him over here that often. Is there an easy way to correlate the column header with its actual property name without guessing and without opening the XML file? No. Most of the time you would just pipe the object to GM and then take a whack at a guess. But there have been times when I had to go dig into the XML file because it wasn't obvious. Uh, you know what, a really good one, I think they fixed this I'm, this is PowerShell 4, I think they fixed this. Uh, the output of get event log lied like a dog. And there was a date field. The underlying object has got like 12 date properties. I'm like, which one is that? Because there's the date that it was logged, the date that it was written, the date that it was confirmed, the date that it doesn't even fill in that's blank and nobody knows why. So I didn't know which one it was. So the only way to tell was to go dig into the XML file. Well, yeah, I, um, I don't think it's to make you mad. I think you have to have a very relaxed attitude about it. Um, they, they did a couple of things that were intended to make things easy and pretty, not necessarily functional. I'll give you a really good example. While we're here on the process object, 
name is an alias because the actual property name is process name. But there's a bunch of, of code buried in PowerShell that only works well if objects have a name property. So they went through all the .NET objects that had to do with systems management, services, processes. They made sure there was a name property because otherwise those underlying assumptions that they made didn't, wouldn't work out. There's like a lot of goofy under the hood stuff it does. And, and here's why. It's your fault. It's because you get so sensitive when there's red error text on the screen and you gnash your teeth and cry and they don't like that. And so rather than exposing you to anything that might upset you, they just have the shell try and do something under the hood that'll make sense. So good example. Uh, processes equals get process. Yes? Everybody's good with that? Makes total sense? Jiggle your heads. Okay. <coughs> processes dot name. What's that mean? Well, but I've got I've got a hundred some objects in there. Wh which one am I referring to? Well, maybe. <laughs> in versions one and two, that generates a processes square bracket. You get a system dot diagnostics dot process square bracket because all it knows to do is show you the type. I don't know. There's a, there's a freaking bunch of them. Which one did you want? Now it implicitly enumerates them under the hood. It does a for each on them under the hood. It'll do that with methods too. It almost invariably kills PowerShell.exe first now. I, I, I half suspect there's code. Because the window will go away and my machine will stay running. Um, so there's, there's a lot of, of goofy gotchas that you run into because there was an attempt to make it, to make it just work. But that, that nece necessitates a layer of abstraction that gets very, very difficult to work against when you run into those. You're like, why isn't it just well? Because it shouldn't actually do that. It makes it fuzzy. Yeah, so his, and, and that's, that's a good point. Part of the reason is because, for example, uh, you know, the property name here is non-paged memory. If, if I allowed non-paged memory, it would be this long of a column. And the default value for these, incidentally, is in bytes. The, the property actually has byte values. So there, there's code in the view file that divides them by a kilobyte. And so they're doing that to kind of contract the, so it was, it was meant to make it pretty. But if you don't know what's going on, it's easy to get in the weeds over it. I totally get it. That's why guys like me used to make money writing books, which apparently you didn't buy. <laughs> so I lose my house. Um, let's go to lunch. Come back at one, yeah? Go eat, go eat food. <laughs>